بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات بفضله تتنزل الخيرات والبركات ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنام حبيب إله العالمين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Blessing be to Allah that uh, with his help and his blessing good deeds are done and with his generosity bounties and grace are received we convey our great greeting and salutation to the Holy Prophet of Islam and his pure progenies. Sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the 10th program within the 2021 Ramadan series. From tonight, we have uh, a, sh a shift in the theme for our program. Where the first phase of the program 2021, we focused on soul searching, spirituality, and uh, spiritual purification. In the second section, we focus on the seerah and the sunnah of the Holy Prophet Wasallam. In the, during the first series or the first few nights, we addressed a number of concepts that were necessary within the context of the soul uh, spirituality. We addressed one of the fundamental, probably pivotal concept that we need to, uh, to uh, eradicate if we start our spiritual journey and that was ghafla or forgetfulness. We talked about repentance we talked about Riyā and Ash-Shirk al-Khafī. We talked about Taqwa, Ghiba and backbiting, as well as social responsibility, where I indicated that no spiritual process or uplifting can take place during the month of Ramadan if we were to forget our responsibility towards fellow human being within the community and outside. Now, tonight we start with uh, a brief intro into the life of the Holy Prophet. But before we do that, which is necessary to understand what we mean by Sunnah and Seerah, uh, we, we need them uh, to, un to use Seerah and Sunnah for how we deal with our crises. No one doubts that the history of Islam and Muslims have entered into a new phase of rapid change. We began, scholars began to, ch to notice this rapid change around 19, late 1960s and early 1970s that uh, and because of the impact of various ideologies that came into uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim life and the necessity for developing a unique strategy or a blueprint to deal with this significant intrusion Unfortunately, once we began to discuss, or the scholars began to discuss how to develop or what should be our approach, two different kind of uh, path evolved. The more secular-minded individuals to control 
the impact of various ideologies coming into Islam and Muslim community, they search for a blueprint or a guidelines into what they call Western or non-Islamic uh, blueprints or guidelines, looking for socialism, communism, and various other isms. I remember during my early uh, time in Hausa, suddenly around late 1960s, suddenly the entire books and uh, newspaper and media was full of either Marx, uh, Angel, Mao, uh, Lenin, and everything else for the, for the youth. And that impacted the youth community, particularly within the Shia community. If you go to the history of Iraq, the Shia community, or the youth at least, were the flag bearers of communism and uh, socialism and so on in, in, in Iraq. Because they were all searching, but there was no methodology or no strategy, no blueprint was available for anyone. As a consequence, they moved for some other ism that is non-Islamic. The others opted for a deeper understanding of what we call, what we have as uh, narrated and uh, recorded from the Holy Prophet. They claim that we really need to have a deeper insight uh, and while we're searching in the wisdom of the Holy Prophet uh, as a strategy to deal with, with the crisis that the community was dealing with. And uh, the foundation of this was if Islam is a universal faith, it must be able to answer the, the crisis and the issues that or challenges that we are dealing with until the end, the, the, the eternity. The only one, the only way we can we deal this is that if we were to look at the history of Islam, Islam has shown right from the beginning of its history that it was able, had the capacity to take ideas from outside reform it, change it, and then make it adap adapted if it's necessary and then implement it in, 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 the, in the life of the Muslim community. As a matter of fact, that uh, a hadith talk about this, that there are three unique approaches. Islam is faced a, a culture or a particular ideology. If it found that this ideology counters its fundamental belief, then reject. If it saw that this uh, ideology had the capacity to morph into Islam, then we accepted it. If it was necessary for this ideology to be evolved, then it evolved it. But the goal remained the same. So for such group, when they talked about searching for a deeper understanding of Islam, and the uh, fundamental of Islam, particularly the way that the Holy Prophet lived and what he did, Sira and Sunnah became an issue that they really needed to focus upon. Nobody doubts that uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam, unique within the understanding of all prophets, no other prophet that has been given the responsibility was able to successfully manage the change and establish a unique social structure in such a short time than the, the, the way that the Holy Prophet did. Uh, he is the one that right from the beginning started with small individuals, turned them into small groups, then took those small groups into a larger goal-orientated uh, larger groups and then use those goal-orientated larger group into what became the foundation of establishing a social structure in Medina that nobody else had done in such a short time. So there must be something. Nobody can, within this process of change, nobody says that the Holy Prophet did not uh, deal with the challenges of his, his time whether it was 
thoughts, ideas, or anything else. So this was something that uh, encouraged scholars uh, to go deeper into understanding of uh, uh, Sira and, and uh, Sunnah uh, and uh, use it to come up with some kind of a strategy or a blueprint of how to de deal with it. Fortunately, for those who m were more secular oriented, they, they didn't succeed. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the Western philosophical or ideological foundation was only narrow, narrow or uh, limited in the scope. It could not be applied or implemented within our own society that deeply steep in say Shia uh, philosophical thought. Yes, a number of youth converted to Shia Shiaism, I mean to, uh, to uh, uh, communism or something, and believed in those uh, uh, social behavior, but very quickly they found out that it cannot be done. I remember in Iraq, we had Marhum Shahid Sayyid Muhammad Bakr Sadr, Muhammad Bakr Hakim, Sheikh Wa'ili, uh, and uh, a number of others. In Iran, we had Marhum Mutahari, Marhum Tabatabai, Marhum Beishti, Shariati, Mufatih, and few others. In the Indian uh, subcontinent, Maududi began writing and talking about the same issue. And in Egypt, Sayyid Qutb, his famous Fi uh, Dalal al Quran, if you read that tafsir, this is the fundamental principles that he really needed to go back to the Quran and the fun fundamentals of the Holy Prophet to be able to somehow come up with a new strategy for this. Now, before we start discussing uh, th th this concept, uh, one thing is quite clear, that we are, as Muslims, fortunate to have uh, hadith and narration available both amply from the Holy Prophet of Islam and Ahlul Bayt. We don't have uh, equal amount to say from uh, other prophets, whether it is Prophet Jesus or Moses or anything else. Because of this fact, the availability, it makes it easier for us uh, to uh, go back to these ahadith and uh, reflect and come up with some kind of a unique strategy. Understood? Uh, uh, we we uh, granted that this ahadith are conflict, conflicting sometimes and we require uh, to, uh, to uh, authenticate and uh, look after and, and check these ahadith to make sure that uh, uh, th these ahadith are relevant in, in, in our case. But uh, the fact that the life of the Holy Prophet from the, air, from the moment of birth until death has been mapped and uh, somehow compiled in various books makes it easier for us to go back and, and, and look at them. Uh, for everyone, because the role of Islam and the relationship between uh, the Holy Prophet and Islam is a unique relationship. The Holy Prophet represents, if Quran is the central book, the revelation, that the, the spirit of the Quran in human manifestation is the Holy Prophet. So the Holy Prophet becomes the heart of Islam and the essential component if somebody wants to understand Islam, we really need to focus on the, the life of the Holy Prophet. And uh, most Muslim, at least within the Shia tradition as well, uh, the Holy Prophet is not just the messenger. The Holy Prophet is considered to be the most perfect example of creation, al-insan al-kamil. The verse that I started at the beginning, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا. Indeed, uh, the Holy Prophet 
is as a messenger and the, uh, the good model for emulating for, the, um, for people who would like to uh, succeed in, in the hereafter. That fact that the Holy Prophet is considered to be the best example became part of the ethos for developing ideas and strategies that deals with the variety of uh, changes that we have to deal with in our life. As the most perfect example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him a unique hikmah and wisdom which, is, which shows itself in the seerah more than it shows in the sunnah. Sunnah is primarily from an Islamic, call it jurisprudential or theological point of view, focuses on deeds, verbal or tacit acceptance of the Holy Prophet. So if the Holy Prophet said something and that can be established, the Holy Prophet did something and that can be authenticated, or before the Holy Prophet somebody did something and he kept quiet and didn't object to it, then these are considered to be part of Sunnah. For the Shia community, we extend similar kind of things to Ahlul Bayt through direct command of the Holy Prophet. So we establish the need to go back to the Holy Prophet as the role model, Al-Insan Al-Kamil, by the verses in the Holy Quran, and then through the uh, statement of the Holy Prophet, we establish the validity of going to Ahlul Bayt for doing the same thing. Uh, he himself, on a number of occasions, has said, "Aatitu jawami al kalim." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has granted me the hikma and the wisdom that nobody else has. As I said just now, that hikma and wisdom reflects in this seerah more than in the sunnah. If Sunnah primarily le legalizes or legitimizes what we have to do as far as the recording of what is narrated from the Holy Prophet. Sunnah Sira deals with the understanding, the rationale that the Holy Prophet used to do uh, and, uh, what he did. Why is it, for example, that uh, or under what circumstance a group of Muslims, early Muslims, from Mecca are being told to immigrate, to go to Habasha where the king is uh, a Christian, but a just ruler. Why to Habasha specifically? The text of the letter that he gives them and the conversation that he deals with Ja'far, uh, Amir al muminins brother, clearly specifies the rationale and the reason for sending this group to, uh, to Habasha. Now we can use that in, uh, implemented in our life when we try to establish some kind of partnership with everybody else. We can be partners with those who are just irrespective of uh, whether their faith is Christian or, uh, or anybody else. Why? Because uh, uh, put, uh, I'm here talking about political act action. So because of the, what the Holy Prophet did. Uh, so the difference between Sunnah and Shia, I mean between Sunnah and Sira is the external and the internal uh, kind of uh, aspect of the, uh, the Holy Prophet's prophetic wisdom that we have received. Where Sunnah focuses on the exterior and Sira focuses on uh, on the interior. If we define Sunnah as what did the Holy Prophet do, Sira says, why did he did what he did? What he did? So you see the difference between the two. In the first context, you list the action of the Holy Prophet. On Friday morning, he offered this prayer. Or at night during Ramadan, he went through these uh, supplications or uh, 
during the month of Shaban or Ramadan, he fasted 10 days or 15 days. The last 10 days of Shaban, he went at a calf, remained in a mosque for soul searching and purification. These are part of Sunnah. But why Sunnah doesn't give us the answer? Sira is the one that gives us the answer. And uh, the, the Iranian revolution, at least in 1979, led us towards more focusing on uh, internal Islam searching for some kind of a strategy or a blueprint for uh, uh, resolving our problem than get, getting, getting it outside. It's this why that creates what as somebody said, an epistemic picture that we can always go back to, to understand how to deal with our crisis. If in the 1960s and 1970s, the scholars were concerned about the, con the life of the youth and the fact that they are being attracted to ideologies that are hostile to Islam, so what should one group of people, Hausa or other places, need to do? When we come here, that's exactly what we are facing today. While we isolate ourselves in a cocoon, that call it the Islamic Center or anywhere else, our youth have even no basic idea about the fundamentals of, the fa fundamentals of faith. So how do we deal with them? Why is it that our youth, irrespective of boys, boys and girls, when they go to university, they are ill-prepared to deal with the challenges, then intellectual challenges or anything else that is presented to them? The parents might be able uh, to, to sustain a little bit of uh, pressure to a point, but the youth certainly not. When it comes to adolescence, our youth, are they don't have the reserve uh, and the capacity or, or at least the expertise to be able to deal with the crisis that we have outside. And they drift. They drift into all kinds of things. Now, how many people call and they say, the parents are bringing their children to the center, Mulana, my son, 12 years old, says there is no God. And he has listened to a number of recordings on the YouTube by some obscure individuals, and they come with the same blabbing on about the same thing. When you ask them questions, where, why the foundation being so weak? Because we somehow step back. We define our role and responsibilities within the prayer and some fawata or this, that's it. No more than that. The fact that once you become uh, you are responsible for the affair of the youth because they are the one that is going to the black, uh, the, the flag bearers for the new next generation. The ones that you see occasionally now, in, they are parents and come to the center. It's because when they were young, during the time of Marhum Allama Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Sherri, there was a clear program organized for them. Sundays and Saturdays to come and sit and talk. Just go to the gallery and you see a few pictures of Marhum Sherry with the, with the youth and talking to them. Not only leading prayer, but answering their questions. So this why question, why did he do it? How did, why, how did he do it? It's, it's a list. Why does the Holy Prophet on his, during Mecca time, on his uh, uh, going from home to the Masjid al-Haram, an old lady keeps pouring ash over her, uh, his head. One day that she doesn't, he immediately becomes concerned for her well-being. Why did when he go to, the, to Medina to establish the foundation of the social structure that we call it, uh, 
the Ummah, the first thing that he tries to do is to bring the communities together, whether Jewish, Arab, or anything else. The so-called protocol of Medina or the constitution of Medina clearly states that it is a goal-orientated society. So long as everyone is prepared to work for peace under the umbrella of the supervision of the Holy Prophet, irrespective of whether Jews or none, they are part of Ummah. It's a unique, even today in the beginning of the 21st century, when people look at uh, the protocol of Medina and look at the whole uh, list of articles in it, they say this must be added to it, uh, must have been added to it later. Because how can you, the Holy Prophet comes and says Jews are part of Ummah. If unity was the primary concern, what the Holy Prophet, why is he doing it? Because he's trying to tell us that you cannot develop a community, successful community, fractured and, and uh, living somehow un ununited or disunited. If that's the case, then how should we, we deal with the unity? So if we want a picture of a reality to, to be able to use it as a blueprint in our society, we really need to go back to the seer, the seer of the Holy Prophet. Now, tonight being the first night, as I did in the first phase, I'm going to stop here and inshallah develop this tomorrow night. But one uh, word of advice. Because we are moving towards a different theme, it doesn't mean that the emphasis on the spirituality and soul searching that we talked about is somehow has come to an end. Far from it. Month of Ramadan is a month of soul searching. Month of purification of the heart, the inner heart month of adjustment, reorientation, month of getting rid of uh, negative traits, even one or two of them. It's only the, the, uh, to create diversity uh, within the month of Ramadan that we divided it into three phases, the first phase, the second phase, and the third phase. But the importance of the first phase remains critical and pivotal for the success during the month of Ramadan. May Allah uh, grant you all the success in uh, being able to achieve at least partial adjustment. I'm not asking even for myself. Partial adjustment during this month is better than nothing. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.